just put this on record. Go and so without further ado, Shauna, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I am glad to be here on behalf of the founder of the consultancy that I represent today, Inclusive Growth Strategies, Danielle. Um, I appreciate you committing to this exercise of training and learning and growing in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in Danielle's absence today, I know she was with you for the first uh, four sessions or four or five of these last two have been me, but um, she uh, thinks very highly and fondly of you all. She has checked in. Are you ready for the California folks? Are you ready for the California? And I, I am indeed. So thank you. Um, let us journey. I'm, you'll be with me today for about an hour and a half. So let's get to it because it's a lot of information uh, to pack into what feels like a little bit of time. Um, as Tracy said, I am Shauna Siobhan. My pronouns are she, they. Um, I am present on social media. I would not say that I have been active. This here world has been a mess. So I have not been uh, on social media. I've thought about it though. Don't get me wrong, I've thought about it. And TikTok keeps me going down a never ending spiral. So I do be overlooking on the TikToks, but for the rest of the social media, I have not been as present, but you can follow me. I'll get it together one day. Um, as Tracy said, I am a veteran of the Air Force. I work, I'm a black person in tech. Um, but I also do these DEI trainings. Um, I am a doula. I am a licensed and ordained uh, pastor and minister. Um, I serve on a couple random boards, transit board, the sustainability board. I am the mother to a six foot five giant uh, who is 16 years old and is currently eating all the food. Um, I made pork chops this morning so that there will be food in the house. And I bet you all your next paychecks that they are all gone uh, right now at 1108 Central Daylight Time. Um, I will soon be the wife to my beloved Ingrid on September 18th. Um, and I still have nothing to wear. So uh, please pray my strength and energy. We are going shopping next weekend, but I live life in the last minute. Um, so just uh, spread a little hope my way that I will find something suitable uh, for such a special day at an affordable price because you know, inflation and recession and such. Um, so one thing before we get started, this is my favorite quote, and I like to say it's not because I wrote it, it's just actually really good. Um, the topic we're going to cover today uh, can be the source of a lot of opinions. People are raised, um, are nurtured, are conditioned in a lot of different environments. Um, today, I may say something you don't like. I may say something you don't agree with. Um, I may say something that goes against what you believe, whether it's from a place of religion, uh, conditioning of your work beliefs, whatever. Um, but I challenge us all to sit in that resistance, to sit in that resistance and challenge ourselves to grow, uh, to explore why we feel the way that we do, um, and to allow the opportunity for growth um, in this moment. I am a firm believer in uh, consent as well as agency. And I would, um, I would say that while uh, you, have been, you have consented to being here because you've opened it up, that does not mean that it has to last the whole time. If I say something that makes you feel uncomfortable or you don't feel like you can go on, please exercise that agency and exit uh, as you need to. I'm not here to stress you out on this Good Friday, but I would like to just give you permission um, because sometimes we need that um, to regulate yourself as needed uh, throughout the training. Um, I like to think that we make it fun, we make it relatable, um, but at the same time, I know it can be triggering and may bring up some stuff depending on what communities you identify in. So we better get started right away. So the Q stands for that, that, that. So where I like to begin is with language. Um, Tracy didn't say it this time, uh, but the last training I held, um, it was, uh, she said that I was in charge. So I would like to believe that that in chargeness transfers to this training too. So because I'm in charge, that means that I get to pick what these definitions are today. You may have feelings and, and emotions uh, surrounding what it means to you, and I support you in that. 
But for today's training, we're going to use the definitions that I give. And trust me, I did not make them up. That would be fun, but I didn't do it for this class. Um, these are the widely accepted uh, definitions that we use uh, in community to discuss these things. Let us make sure we're going forward. There we go. Gender. So I will start by sharing that gender is a social construct. Uh, the characteristics of women, men, girl, boys are socially constructed. It includes norms, behaviors, roles uh, associated with being a man, boy, or girl in their relationship with each other. So for example, um, the idea that boys wear blue and girls wear pink. Boys play with trucks while girls play with dolls. Um, girls cook um, dinner while boys go to work and earn the money or whatever the case may be. That is all gender. Um, from, a play, from a place of society, we've given those roles based on whether it's colonialism, uh, patriarchal things, imperialism, all the isms that one could think of have influenced how we see these roles. Um, so when we talk about it being socially constructed, I think it's important to think about um, the elements of yourself that may not fit what the gender identity says it should be. So, for example, as Tracy and I were discussing as you all were coming in, I was in the Air Force for 10 years. I was a KC-135 straddle tanker avionics engineer, but I also could change an aircraft tire. I called flight commands before the pilots took off. I could change a, a radio altimeter. I've rewired jets. And I was the first woman, when the first Black woman in my squadron. So, yep, I was a full-on female presenting person. And on one side, I had my purse. And on the other side, I carried a 72-pound toolbox. A lot of people would say, oh, wow, that's not a feminine job. Or that's not a woman's job. But I was a woman and I was doing it. So it, had, it challenged that idea of gender. And so think about ways that you yourself from a gender perspective, not from who you are attracted to, and we'll talk more about that later, but just from what society says that as your gender, you should do. Think about ways that you have pushed up against that norm. Um, Toni Morrison, one of my favorite authors who now is with the ancestors, uh, has a book called The Bluest Eye. And in the beginning, uh, the daughter is given a doll and she did not want that doll. She did not ask for that doll. She did not want that doll. And Toni Morrison explores what it meant to be socially conditioned at three, four, sometimes two years old to take care of this thing and take care of this baby. Who at two years old wants the responsibility of care for Wet and Betsy? She pees, she needs a bottle, she cries. Like who wants to do that while the boy gets to throw his truck in the toilet and everything is okay? So think about what those roles have meant to you growing up and how they may impact your children, your grandchildren, so on and so forth. Biological sex. So we just talked about gender and gender identity. Biological sex, that is the label you're given at birth based on medical factors. So uh, the makeup of your hormones, your chromosomes, your genitals, most are assigned male or female. Your biological sex, may or may not be the same as your gender identity. So biological sex is what you are assigned at the hospital. Uh, you come out, either you come up through the belly in the cesarean section, or you, uh, you come out uh, through the bottom in a vaginal birth, and you they slap you on the bottom, and then they turn you over and look, and then they say, that is a boy, or that is a girl, or this child is intersex, depending on what that looks like. That is your biological sex. The designator of male and female is not gender. That is biological. So now let's talk about the other things and the other things we talk about. So cisgenderedness. A lot of people wonder like, what does that mean? Like, why do I have to be called something if I, I'm, a, I'm a girl, I was born a girl, I look like a girl. So why do I have this extra label now? Cisgender, denoting or relating to a person whose sense of identity and gender corresponds with their birth sex. If you were born assigned female at birth and your gender identity is as a woman, then you are cisgendered. It means that your gender identity, your personal identity aligns with 
what you were assigned right after you got popped on the bottom to get that first cry. If that is not the case, then you are considered or, or can be considered depending on how you identify the words that you use as transgender. So cis just means the same. C-I-S, the prefix just means same. So same gender, the, your biological and your gender identity are the same. So transgender, people that have a gender identity or expression that differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. So uh, when you were born, slapped on the bottom, said to be female, at whatever age it happened for you, you realize that it is out of alignment with everything that you feel in your body, everything you think about yourself, what you see when you look at in the mirror, um, you may identify as male or non-binary. And so you are transgender because there is not alignment, there's not sameness between your gender identity or personal identity and the sex you were assigned biologically at birth. So this is why there are a lot of conversations now um, because of this cisgender to transgender identity. There are a lot of conversations now. Um, I remember a couple years ago, for example, um, sanitary napkin company always um, took some heat because they had the, uh, the icon for female or for woman was on the packaging. And a lot of members of the trans community or the non-binary community um, shared that it made them feel a bit of dysmorphia or made them feel out of alignment uh, to purchase those things. Um, so uh, always change the packaging to make it less woman directed in that sense and allow it to be what it is because based on transgender versus cisgender identities, uh, you don't have to identify as a woman to menstruate. Uh, you do not have to be what is biologically called, a, uh, what is gender called a woman to have periods, to give birth. So now you hear things like uh, birther instead of mother, or you hear chest feeding instead of breastfeeding, um, or you hear people who give birth. Um, and it's about being inclusive. It is not to take away the rights or uh, to take away the language from biologically assigned women. Um, it is not to devalue or diminish the role of um, biologically assigned women and females in childbirth or anything like that. It is about being inclusive and having language for other members of community that doesn't cause them, whether it's dysmorphia um, or uh, make them feel outside of their identity characteristics. So part of that conversation, just to, I like to make things relatable. Um, so the writer of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, um, is what is called a TERF. Um, so you may hear and see a lot in gender circles, or you may see it a lot on uh, Facebook or Instagram, where a lot of people are upset with her and people like Macy Gray and a few other people because they are considered trans exclusionary radical feminists, meaning that they don't believe that trans women are women, that there should be a difference in access, a difference in resources, um, differences in how um, how we are invited to different things. So if it's a woman's only conference, that trans women should not always be allowed. Um, so that's what it means when you hear this term turf. And that's all the drama associated with JK Rowling and people like Macy Gray, who don't believe that trans women are women. Um, and so it falls into that category uh, where people um, don't necessarily agree or would like to exclude based on gender expression. So you've heard me say gender identity, sexual identity, biological sex. So this is where you start getting into where the language is really important um, because I hear a lot of arguments around some of these things that aren't accurate. So your gender identity is your deeply held inner feeling of whether you're a female or male, both or neither. It's not something that can be seen by others. Um, it can be the same as your biological sex, which is cisgender or different, which is transgender. So your gender identity is just how you see and how you feel within yourself. No one can define that for you. It's not assigned at birth, or maybe it is if you still cisgender, but it's up to you. It, and it can vary. It can be as fluid as the river. Um, it can be as static as you would like it to be. Um, you can feel, you can be born biologically represented in one category and over time feel different. Um, for me, I am very feminine presenting. 
And but I choose to identify um, and I feel more in alignment identifying as non-binary or gender non-conforming. So when we talk about the binary, I don't even know if I have non-binary as a slide, so I'll throw it in right here, get a bonus. Um, when I talk about non-binary, so you know in IT or in computer language, and I say that so casually, maybe you don't know, but in computer language, all code is made up of ones and zeros. It's like the matrix. Everything is made of ones and zeros. Uh, the English language is very binary, ones and zeros. A lot of the other languages, Spanish and French and Italian and Hebrew and Arabic, and a lot of those have much more room uh, for gender expression and gender identity. You can take many objects and make them, whether it's masculine or feminine, without having to change the language. English isn't like that. And that's why we've had to add all these different things, because we live in a very binary society. So when we talk about non-binariness or gender non-conforming, it's people saying, I don't align with the social construct of gender as it exists. So I'd like to remove myself from that whole system. And I'd like to be, I feel more uh, resonance with non-binary. So that's when you start getting into some of those other pronouns like they or them, or, or uh, even as it relates to um, some of the other ones that people may not be as familiar with, uh, Zim or Zay, uh, with an X or with a Z. Um, and the important thing I think to think about here and to say is people's gender identity doesn't require our agreement. So someone can tell you that their pronouns are Zay, Zim, and you may not agree, you may not like it, you may not have ever seen those phrases and words in your whole entire life. But guess what? It doesn't matter. Uh, you don't have to agree. And you here's the real deal. You don't even have to use those pronouns. You can call them by their actual name every time, all the time. But what is best and what we don't want to do is further create dysmorphic opportunities or further um, alienate people from their right to be called as they feel and call them something else. So if someone tells you their pronoun is they, them, and you're like, ah, I, I like she, her. So I'm going to go with that. Um, you become complicit in a lot of the issues and the problems that make people feel like they don't belong today. So gender identity, not sexual orientation. So people that say, oh my gosh, you let your 13 year old decide whether they feel like a boy or a girl. Oh my gosh, you let your 15 year old decide. Oh, the ethical and moral things. Oh my gosh, you let them have sex. Well, wait a minute. Nobody's out here letting 13 year olds have sex. Um, it is not to know that your gender and your biological sex are out of alignment does not mean that you are ready to make a decision about sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is about who you're attracted to and who you feel romantically, emotionally, and, and sexually attracted to. To most 12 and 13 year old boys are icky, girls are icky, dogs are icky, bass are icky. Like um, They're not all making the decision or the choice about who they're gonna be with for the rest of their lives. So we have to be careful not to conflate the two. Sexual orientation is also very fluid. Um, it can include an attraction to the opposite sex. It could be a same gender attraction. Um, you can be more pansexual and have an attraction that exists outside of gender, meaning you may be attracted to a variety uh, of things, um, but it is very fluid. It is up to change. I didn't come out um, as a lesbian until I was 40 years old because, um, America, right? Um, and a lot of surrounding countries. Um, I grew up um, and I think I knew what my sexual orientation was at about seven, 16, 17 years old and probably sooner, but I would say I really became clear, but it wasn't gonna be accepted in my family who were devout Catholics. Um, then I joined a military that was don't ask, don't tell. Um, and so it was back in the closet for me. Um, and then uh, getting caught up in evangelical Christian circles, um, it was don't ask, don't tell, and don't go to hell too. And so that made it very difficult uh, to, to want to be free. And then I really believe that one day I woke up and said, this sure does suck. Um, and I made a different choice. Um, and I found freedom. Um, I lost all my friends. Um, like when I say all, I truly do mean 
80 to 90 percent of my relationships have been military and or church relationships. So they're all gone. But the freedom I feel in getting to be myself and to exist, even though it's difficult, um, has been well worth it. So I always tell people who say gender and sexual orientation is a choice. I always say, oh, I know you lying, because if I had a choice, I would have chose the easy route, which in America is heteronormativity. And so I would have chosen that if I had a choice. No one chooses the hardship of trying to um, navigate being a protected class that's not very protected in these United States of America. Alphabets, LGBTQ2IA. So the L, lesbian, the G, gay, uh, the B, bisexual, the T, transgender, the Q is often queer and or questioning. In some spaces, queer is still thought to be a slur, um, but a lot of, uh, especially in the Black and Brown communities, have reclaimed the queer uh, to stand for um, any same gendered or non-heteronormative approach to sexual orientation. So uh, when it comes to the Q, Saying queer is not always socially acceptable, but you have to trust people to tell you their truth as it relates to that. The two is for two-spirit and embraces our indigenous community um, and where they fall in the lettered uh, nest of the LGBTQ community. Um, the I is for intersex. Uh, back when, I don't know if it was when I was young, I'm still kind of young, but um, before probably the last 10 years, the term, uh, which is now considered inappropriate, was hermaphrodite. Um, that term is no longer used. It is now intersex, uh, meaning that uh, you were born with a variety with uh, both biologically male and uh, biologically female markers, whether in your genitalia, your reproductive system, hormonally, chromosomally. Um, and very often the parent makes the choice as to uh, how to align uh, that. And there's been a lot of talk around um, what it means to wait for a child to kind of say themselves um, what that means. But that also comes with some medical things. Uh, part of the reason a lot of parents transition or allow their children to transition at 12, 13 years old is because a lot of things change in puberty that are not able to be reversed and to make a child. So for example, if a child starts um, hormones uh, early enough, uh, it could prolong puberty or it can stop uh, breast tissue uh, from growing at a certain rate, it'll stop the voice change. So if you have a biological male who identifies or whose gender identity is female and is transgender, an important part of that is body alignment. And so allowing a, a person to transition pre-puberty is a choice a lot of parents make to give their child an opportunity or the best opportunity to exist in a world that values passing. Um, one thing I'd like to say as it relates to trans people, um, dressing a, a male, a biological male dressing as a woman doesn't make them trans and it doesn't mean that they're not. Um, there are different elements in community, whether you talk drag queen um, or a person, a cross dresser or a person who, who just prefers dressing in other clothes. So you just can't assume. Um, but also passing can be a privilege. Not all trans uh, men and women and non-binary folk have access to medical resources, to finances. Um, so we can't assume that just because someone may physically present in a certain way that we know their gender identity because everyone isn't um, Caitlyn Jenner and has access, or Laverne Cox, and has access to hundreds and thousands of dollars in medical care and surgeries and um, uh, affordability of clothing and makeup and weave and hair and all of these things that can attribute to uh, someone's safety or can attribute to someone feeling in alignment with their identity. Um, so that's something to think about too. Um, the A is for asexual, which speaks to, a lot of people say it's for ally um, or advocate. I don't like that personally because uh, these letters center community that may not necessarily be heterosexual. And I, I don't feel like any of those letters 
all the letters of the alphabet are for uh, straight, hetero, very often white people. So like these letters get to be for this community. So in my per from my personal standpoint, and, and don't beat me up, um, the A, uh, I tend to side with it being asexual, which is um, also a range. So you can be asexual, uh, meaning that you may not have a uh, romantic interest in sex, that you may not participate in sexual activity um, or have a desire to have sex. But there's a, a range and a spectrum for that too. You have gray sexuals, you have demisexuals, um, you have aromantic folks. So that's why we put that plus there to offer opportunities for people to find space and see themselves in community, even when it's not just the L and the G. So here's where you get to play. Um, and everybody who was here last time knows my rule. If none of the other attendees speak up, I'm just going to call on the people whose names I know. So um, we just went over language. Was there anything that you didn't know or anything that I was able to make clear for you um, in a way that now you get it or now um, you have a better or a different understanding of it, uh, feel free to uh, mic and talk to me. This is a conversation, not a lecture. I don't want to feel like I'm getting my academia on today. Shanna, this is Diana Couch. Hi, Diana. Hi. Um, when someone has, has chosen the pronoun they, how do we speak with them? How do you refer to them? Do you refer to them as whenever you would have used she or he, you would use they instead? Yep. You absolutely have it. So um, typically, like if you were speaking to someone, um, so let's say Tracy used they, them. Um, I would say I was just talking to Tracy the other day and they said that they were going to uh, Disney for the summer. Uh, do you Have you thought about going with them or do you know if they are taking the kids? Um, but if you were going to talk to them, you would still say Tracy, you know, hey, Tracy, how are you? I, I wonder how you were doing. I was talking to John and I told him that uh, you and the family, because it's still you. Um, but when referring to them, you would just exchange she with they. And when um, her, it could be them. So, yeah, you would just swap it out and use it just like you would she, her, hers. OK, thank you. You're welcome, Diana. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is, this is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much for the presentation so far. Yeah, turf was a term I hadn't heard before. Um, although somewhat ironically, we were in London last week and went to the Harry Potter exhibition. That's probably not the right name, but uh, both of my daughters were uh, excited but conflicted because they understood uh, where J.K. Rowling stands right now, and mm -hmm. either of them support that. So, um, but I'd be interested to know if either of them actually have heard that term either. They didn't mention it to me anyway. I appreciated, you know, kind of having a name for it. Um, it mm -hmm. makes it clear about where she, in this case, and others like her stand. So, thanks for that. Absolutely, it, it's it's. Um... It's unfortunate when the heroes of our childhood or those who have been such an integral part, you find out their politic is out of alignment. So I'm sorry your daughters are having to experience that um, because it's tough even for me as an adult, um, whether it's so, some things it's not tough for, like unaligning and never listening to R. Kelly again, easy. Uh, Harry Potter, not so. Not as easy, but still doable. And I remember, so I didn't read the Harry Potter books as they came out. I was part of a very evangelical church who said, don't read Harry Potter, don't play with Pokemon, it's having a devil in your pocket. It, I mean, it, it was a lot. I am no longer there. Uh, I don't preach that way or teach that way, but it, it was a lot. So I didn't read Harry Potter until um, I was probably in my late 30s, early 40s. Like I binge read them. I'm up all night, like I'm 10 years old with the flashlight under the cover reading these books. And then I find out about J.K. Rowling. And so the question becomes, do you separate the artist from the art? Uh, how do you how do you make space for your beloved Hermione and Harry and the, the little Weasleys? And like, how do you make space for these characters that you've fallen in love with, yet understanding that the politic uh, is what it is? And I joke and I tell people, if my pastor would have told me, they, my pastor told me that Harry Potter was about wizards and devils, so I couldn't read it. If he would have told me she was a turf, I wouldn't have read it. Like, tell me the important stuff. You know, and so it, it is a very difficult thing. And I'm sorry that we still exist in a world where your children have to navigate that space. Hello. 
Hi, I, I have a question. Sure, um, who's talking to me? I don't I'm, see it. No, I'm not on. I'm somewhere I can't go on camera. My okay. name is okay. Perfect. My, okay. my name is Dawn, and I thought this would be a good place to ask this question because I enjoy conversation, and I like to just you know bring things up to you know for conversation. I, I've seen, as we've seen more in media and entertainment and other places, more uh, men who, and I want to say this respectfully because I'm learning, I'm part of the community, but I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see more men who have transitioned into women mm -hmm. and they're more visible, but we mm -hmm. don't see a lot of women who transition into men in the arts and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is for conversation sake. Are the men who transition into women, are they experiencing male privilege? Mm, oh, that's good. For conversation's so, sake, just for conversation's no, sake. No, you, you, that's good. Yep. Okay, <laughs> I like okay. it. Um, All right. No, you about to make me giggle. I like this. So okay. <laughs> you absolutely, when, a little later on, we'll talk about intersectionality. And that is a perfect example of intersectionality. So when we talk about men who transition into women and or transgendered women, which is uh, generally M to F, um, privilege is an interesting thing because privilege, privilege exists anywhere um, you have access to resources um, or uh, any type of betterment that isn't afforded to the rest of the population or to other socially marginalized groups. So when um, I do think that in some ways there are certain privileges for men to get the ability to choose and move in certain ways. But when we think about the Black community, the most dangerous community to exist in right now is Black transgender women. They are being murdered at rates uh, that are out of control. I mean, and, and I don't want to trigger anyone, so trigger warning, but um, police aren't following up. The community doesn't care. They're dead named in articles. Um, so I think there may be a certain amount of privilege to choose. Um, as we can see, even reproduction is controlled by uh, a society that is white and that is male. Um, and so there is a certain amount. But the other side of that, and I think why we don't see um, visually a lot of female to male in the same way, um, number one, because uh, passing, it is easier from a biological or from a representation standpoint for a person to not only identify as more masculine, but the things required to pass in society are different. When you are a woman, the burden of womanness and makeup and boobies and perfumes and weaves and hair and what is respectability is so high in comparison to what we expect out of men as from a place of how we show up. Um, so a lot of times there are a lot of, there may be more female to male transgender people. You just don't know it because the presence of testosterone or access to uh, T uh, makes the voice deeper. It creates the beards. It You can bind your breast, and there are certain things that make it harder or more difficult to identify. Um, and I also think that there may be a lot of social things, like you said, that surround the ability or the idea that a woman or female has the right to choose what the identity looks like and the danger that may exist for them. Does that make sense, Dawn? It does. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate that. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay. So let's talk about some people, pronouns, and practice. Maya Angelou, another one, another person who has passed and transitioned to our ancestral realm, has said, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. I'm going to speak for Auntie Maya and say there's a little piece in there that matters. You could go to the gym. Let's say you went to the gym this morning and you came home and you just logged right in and got in this course. Now, luckily it's over Zoom and we don't have smell o vision but your poor puppy that's sitting beside you is gagging and can't breathe because you did not take your shower. So knowing better is knowing that you went to the gym and you should take a shower. Applying what you know is taking the shower and using soap. So now you've done better. Getting in the shower without soap, as I've had to explain to my teenager, it don't do nothing. You have just wet the dead skin and dried it off. 
that's knowing better and then thinking you're doing better. There has to be a level of application because it's the application of what you know that changes our communities, that changes our environments. So I love do the best you can until you know better. Okay, I'll, I'll sign up for that. But it's not just knowing better because a lot of people know better and still do really foolish things. A lot. Think of the times where you have known better and still did something absolutely ridiculous. Um, you don't have to tell me, just hold it in your mind. <laughs> think of those moments when you knew you knew good and well you had $19 in your bank account till Friday, but you really wanted that four for four. And you knew you could have went to the grocery store and probably got a whole pack of beef and made hamburgers every day, but ah, you didn't do better. So it's just thinking about areas that we really knew better and didn't do nothing and really looking at what it means to apply what we know. Inclusion versus belonging. So when we have these DEI conversation, of course, the E stands for equity, the I stands for inclusion, but I like to offer and bring in belonging. Um, I work and consult as the belonging strategist because I think in order to go, in order to be a society um, and to be in community where things are actually better, we have to move past equality into equity and we have to move past inclusion into belonging. Um, so inclusion is the practices and policies of providing equal access who might, uh, for people who may be excluded or marginalized. So think about a piece of paper. See, when I come to the studio, I don't have all my stuff on my desk. Think about a piece of paper. And when you were in school and you were learning how to write, not in cursive anymore, because they have denied these poor children the struggle of trying to loop them letters together. But you look at a piece of paper and you have all this paper to write on. And then there's that bluish or pinkish line on the side. And then the outside of that is the margin. Um, and you were taught never to write in those margins. Only put numbers, one, two, three, four, five, or whatever in those margins. But when you think about that piece of paper and think about how many people exist in the world that way, we live in these margins. We live in communities where people don't have access to food. They don't have access to shelter. They don't have access to education or resources. Um, and you start thinking about that margin in a little different of a way. So inclusion is very organizational. Think about the organizations, the nonprofits, the jobs you have, and what that looks like. So belonging goes further. Belonging is the feeling of security and support when there's a sense of acceptance and inclusion and identity for members of certain groups. It's when a person can bring their whole authentic self. So the difference is belonging. It's not about practices and policies. It's not about saying, uh-oh, uh, we, um, you know, right now that uh, only has an elevator to get to, uh, or ha doesn't have an elevator, it only has steps to get to the other floors. And um, so a person who is in a wheelchair can't come. Oh, okay, you need to do some inclusion work. There's laws about that, get it together. Uh, you need to do some inclusion work. But belonging is when that person not only has the access to get there, but doesn't feel othered while they're there. And that's a difficult thing. Um, as a person who lives life at a lot of identities, I, I generally am in a constant state of feeling outside the box. Um, because again, we live in a uh, colonized, um, United States, where uh, the primary system is white and male and heterosexual. And so for a person who identifies and lives like me, it, it's difficult because it always seems like you're fighting. You're fighting, you're warring, you're trying to get access. You're kicking this door down, flipping this table over, and it can be exhausting. But the more spaces I find to belong, the easier it becomes to feel like things are shifting and that we're making a difference. Um, so uh, when I believe it was Dawn, when Dawn asked her question earlier um, and I told us look out for this intersectionality part. If you don't remember anything else about what I said today and you actually better, but if you don't, I will let you slide. It is Friday. Um, remember this piece, intersectionality. It's the lens through which you see where power comes and collides where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there's a race problem or a gender problem or a class problem. Uh, the term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. The need for intersectionality existed since the beginning of time. 
Um, intersectionality is about being able to recognize the power systems at play when we talk about problems, access, or marginalized communities. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is also part of the group that coined critical race theory, which just as a primer never existed in any public school system. It is a law, um, it is a law curriculum that exists in only a few uh, law schools. But intersectionality um, allows you to see the world through a lens of what other things could be at play. So when we think about racism, um, or we think about the system of white supremacy and race, a huge element of what allowed white supremacy and racism to uh, grow and be justified in these United States of America was this idea of power. So when you hear things like Black people can't be racist, and I know a lot of people shrug their shoulders and turn up their nose at that, but the system of oppression and racism requires access to power to keep out a group. And so when we think about um, what exists or how a person exists, you have their identity to look at. Are they cisgender, transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming? Um, what's their sexual orientation? Uh, what's their race? What class are they represented in? What's their occupational status? Because if you just look at one, you may be solving the wrong problem. Intersectionality recognizes that uh, Susan and Crystal got kicked out of their apartment um, because the landlord was homophobic and found out that they just weren't roommates. Um, because they got kicked out of their apartment, they were homeless and could not find a shelter because shelters did not uh, allow for same gendered relationships. Um, they were not able to go stay in the one shelter uh, because it was hosted by a church that did not believe in interracial relationships. And then there's a race issue, there's a gender issue. So how do you begin to solve their problem? If you're the social worker, if you're the aid provider, if you're the caretaker, you can't just look at their race because what about the gender aspect? You can't just look at the gender aspect. Because what about the race aspect? So when you look at people as their whole selves and the intersecting identities, it really helps to be able to provide care, to understand um, existing trauma, um, to have a cultural congruency um, and competency, and really begin to do the things that are necessary to solve, uh, to address, and to provide uh, levels of care that are inclusive and support belonging. Pronouns. A pronoun, I, me, El, Elia, he, she, herself, you, it, that, they, each, few, many, who, whoever, you know, whatever, is a word that takes the place of a noun. We all know that. We didn't all been to school. We know how to do it with animals. We know how to do it with stuff. I don't know what makes it so hard for people to do it with humans. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm going to just offer that we all get it together. It, it, it is, it sucks. It's hard to exist in a world where people won't even name you correctly. You don't gotta like it. You don't have to, uh, what do people, what's the word people use? Uh, you don't have to tolerate it or accept it, but you do gotta do it. And nobody likes to be told what to do. So you might really be mad at me right now and you might have turned me all the way down so you just see my lips moving. But we gotta do it, we have to. When someone's name is difficult, you got to learn how to pronounce it and you got to do it right. When someone comes from a different culture and their name may uh, include uh, uh, glottal sounds or whatever different things, you got to figure that out and you got to do it. Um, we have figured out how to pronounce a number of things. So surely we can do that. Um, pronouns are important because they honor the identity and lived experience of those people we communicate with. They create inclusive environments and they move towards belonging. I struggle with pronouns. I prefer not to be part of this raggedy social construct of gender. I do like pink things, but I'll rock a real pretty blue too. I have never liked doll babies because I, from a very early age, did not understand why I got to take care of something else where I don't even want to deal with my own self. I think it's foolishness to each their own, but I've never enjoyed that. But I didn't want to play with trucks either. I really get down with dinosaurs. I can appreciate a real good looking dinosaur. 
But um, I also know that I am very feminine presenting. My nails are inches and inches and inches long. Um, I'm going to flip this hair uh, like Willow from time to time. Um, so it is a lot easier when people see me to say she. And because we still live in a culture that struggles so hard with naming people correctly, I would prefer they, but I just don't have the energy and the strength to be correcting folks all day. I am tired. My nerves are bad. I got a teenage child. Like I don't have time to be raising a teenager and correcting you. Um, so just try. All, all I can ask is that you try. Next time you come across somebody and you see that their pronouns are in their username, just try. Just think, think about me and my life and my teenage kid and my upcoming wedding that I don't got to dress for and a full-time job I work in the day and the DEI classes I teach to folks by night and say, you know what? I'm going to say they this time for Shauna. Do it for me. The practice is to perform or exercise a skill repeatedly to get better. What happens when you get it wrong? So um, let me think of a good uh, name here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking mm -hmm. Taylor. You know that somebody just started at your job named Taylor. You don't know if Taylor is a him or a her, a he or a she, a L or an Elia. You do not know. You meet Taylor and you look at Taylor and it's very ambiguous. Taylor is dressed right in the center. Taylor's hair is right in the, you have no idea. And you're just kind of looking and you're trying to figure it out because you've been to my training and you're like, I don't want to disappoint Shauna. I know she's thousands of miles away, but she's going to feel when I get this wrong. Let me, let me see what I can do. They say, hey, Taylor, everybody introduces and you walk up and you're talking to Taylor and it's been no problem. Their voice right in the middle. There is no indicator of what their pronouns are. You are struggling. You bet your work bestie come up and you like, oh, Keisha, come over here and meet Taylor. She just started today. And the HR person melts into a blob of embarrassment. And Taylor says, oh, no, it's they, them. Please do not fall apart. Taylor has been correcting people all their life. You are not the first and won't be the last. And Taylor is at a new job and does not have time to absolve you of your mistake. What do you do? You apologize. I am so sorry, Taylor. Thank you for correcting me. Hey, Keisha, this is Taylor. They started today. You see how smooth that was? You see Taylor didn't have to pick you up from a ball of pronoun incorrectness and, and soothe your aching, sorry soul. You see how you didn't make an apology sandwich? Oh my God, I am so sorry. I try to do this pronouns thing, but it's so new to me and I'm straight and I have 10 kids and I went to the grocery store and I got soup and I just don't know. Don't nobody got time for all that. Taylor trying to do orientation. Taylor got to go meet everybody else. Taylor didn't wear their good shoes. They feet hurt. They don't have time for that. Apologize. Correct yourself. Keep it moving. And then practice. Okay, so Taylor is a day. It don't matter if Taylor wear a dress tomorrow. It don't matter if Taylor wear ruby woo lipstick, which is the best red. It's by MAG. It's the best red lipstick ever. Um, it has a blue undertone for all of you that are wondering. So it makes your teeth look really, really white, not yellow, like some reds. I don't care if Taylor show up at ruby woo tomorrow. They are a they. Why are they a they? Because they said so. And when we can embrace that. So why does this person that looks like a, a female uh, assigned at birth, why do they want to be he, him? Because they want to. Remember being a kid and somebody said, because I said so and you hated it. You wanted to flip your mama's TV on the floor. Maybe you did. Maybe that was just me. Maybe I had some anger issues. But don't tell me because you said so. Like, give me a good reason. My logical brain does not, does not accept because I said so as a reasonable reason as to why I got to do this. That was until I became a mother. <laughs> and before I realized that you reach a point where you just don't have explanations. And because I said so is the quickest route between, would you like to continue living here? Or do you want to go be under that bridge down there with some other folks that have lost the ability to provide? Now, would you choose? So sometimes because I said so is the kindest thing that I can say. So we need to apply a lens of because I said so when we don't understand why people are doing the things that they're doing that do not cause you harm. 
why does uh why does Renee want to be he him because he said so why does Mike want to be she her hers because she said so and that's enough for us that's enough for you that's enough for me When we have these conversations, things come up. What if I don't know a person's pronouns? What if I don't agree with a person's sexuality or gender? What about the bathroom? That's my favorite. Somebody always asks me, well, what if I see them in the bathroom? Well, unless they ask me you to wipe their bottom, mind your business. Uh, what if somebody comes out to me? And we'll talk about that later too, because that's one of the, um, what do you call them, breakout questions. It is 1156. We are about to break out. Before we go, I know that was a lot of information. Tracy said I had to be on time or she was never talking to me again. And so I had to get it together because she don't always treat me right. So just kidding, Tracy's very kind. Oh, I don't think the director over here. So you ain't gonna get in trouble, Tracy. Um, but I wanna keep us on time. I wanna keep us progressing forward. We are about to move into the breakout sessions where we're gonna have some really good conversations around gender diversity. But before we go, does anybody have a question? How are we feeling about pronouns? If you offended, you can tell me that too. I, I, I do care. I know I come across like, well, whatever. But I don't, I do care because your areas of offense help inform how I continue to drill in because it's okay. There were times where I didn't think the way I think. Remember, evangelical. There were times where I was like, oh, it's a choice. I can just choose otherwise. Meanwhile, I'm sitting beside this boy in my service. She sure look cute. So I'm trying not to look over there because I am in compulsive heteronormativity, compulsory heteronormativity here. So don't get me wrong. I have not arrived. I have not always been this uh, beautiful, enlightened person that you see now. And there is still work that I have to do around different things. So don't feel like I got it all together and I came here to, to slap you and tell you that you don't. Nope, we're gonna be kind to ourselves. We're gonna be patient as we learn and grow outside of our bias and comfort zones. And we're gonna do it together. So any questions before we break out into our breakout rooms? Shawna, you have a, uh, a chat, um, Demetrius says, this has been uh, so great. You are very informative, knowledgeable, and funny as all get out, Shauna. And um, Shauna will Venmo you the money for that, Demetrius. Oh. <laughs> we appreciate a good Venmo, Demetrius. Thank you. <laughs> um, we also have Lisa. I only had this on my calendar for an hour. I need to move on to other work. Thank you so much for the session. Shauna is awesome. Desiree, I have to go to another meeting. Thank you for this great information. So you're getting- Of course, of course. Getting Thank a lot you of for coming, Desiree. Thank you um, for those who have to get out of here. Y'all so nice. I'll be forgetting to look at the chat. That could be my little boost. Sometimes the chat be reckless in some places. You're welcome, Renita. So let's see, how many folks do we have? Who's on uh, breakout duty? We have- it says 24 people. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, five breakouts. I don't know how. Um, so sometimes, so Tracy, you know, you all don't have to go into the breakouts. So out of this 24, I say, even if the four or five of you don't go, that still gives us 20. Uh, do five breakout rooms. And I am going to, if you are in, when you get to your room, if you are in breakout room one, you will answer the question, um, question one. So whoever's gonna put those in the chat, put room one up. Oh, Stephanie, you own she, it, thank you. She's on top of it. Yeah. So number one, your 14 year old niece tells you they believe they are transgender. What do you do? What are your next steps? That's room one. If you get to a room and your room say room one, that's you. Room two, someone continually misgenders a coworker. Think about Taylor. Someone continuously misgenders Taylor, a coworker, in private and in public. What do you do? The third group is going to create a pronoun skit where you show how to properly correct misgendering someone. The fourth group is going to come up with three ways to continue to educate yourself on gender diversity, and then you're going to share it with us. The last group is going to search. They're going to use the power of the good Google 
um, and search and share three gender diverse activists and their area of advocacy. Keep intersectionality in mind. So I want you to get out there on Google or Instagram or the tick and the talk and search for some folks that are doing work in the trans community. I'm gonna give you a couple so you can't use them. <laughs> uh, think about people, if we're thinking about the famous side, think about people like Billy Porter, Janet Mock, India Moore, the whole cast of Pose, you know, um, or uh, other folks who are a little closer to home, like Rachel Cargill, um, I Heart Erica. Uh, ooh, okay, I'm gonna stop because I'm gonna take all the people and you're not gonna find them. Um, so find yourself three people. Thank you, Diana. She had to leave. Okay. Um, so are there any questions? So that's five groups. Let me see. 20 people. Um, yeah, that should be that that should be good. So Stephanie gonna send y'all away to you want the breakout rooms to people? Ooh, it is 1201 here. So that is um, what time is it? 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's 10 o'clock there. Let us break out until I'm gonna give y'all 10 minutes. Okay. So the people doing the skit, I don't expect you to be Lynn Manuel Miranda. Okay. So don't be out here trying to reproduce Hamilton and they come back and don't have nothing. All right. Um, so 10 minutes. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Cheryl, I will put um, my email in the chat. Um, mm -mm. And I am anywhere you look, I am Shauna Shaman at Shauna Shaman. Um, I have a slide at the end with that information, but just in case you got to go quick. Okay, opening the breakout rooms now. Thanks, Stephanie. Bye, Bye guys. Ooh, them rooms go quick. And now everybody's coming back. Come on in the room as the old spiritual goes. It looks like we're back. Hopefully the breakouts went well for you all. It is 1213, so we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, will a representative from group two uh, discuss how someone, can, um, how you handle someone continuous, continuously misgendering Taylor um, in private and in public? What did you do? What did group two, room two, come up with for that? Was anybody in group two? Let me see. Somebody just said something in the chat. Uh oh, Brittany's group had uh, tech issues. I understand. Hello, this is Amira. I can. Um, I was a member of Group Two. Okay, Amira. And we came up with several different types of scenarios that you know it depends. Like if we have a good rapport with that other coworker, that uh, then maybe we could you know kind of pull them to the side, and you know mm -hmm. speak with them regarding the pronouns. But you know also another. Uh, member said that maybe we can, you know, and just in conversation with them, we can kind of hint and use the proper pronoun. So hopefully, you know, that's something that they would pick up on, mm -hmm. you know, with using correct pronouns. And then we also, you know, talked about, you know, being cautious because, you know, addressing an individual regarding the improper use of pronouns could be something that could be an HR issue. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to, you know, speak to someone inappropriately and then in turn you end up getting reprimanded mm -hmm. and um and then Brittany just said she was having issues with her she was saying using a gentle approach like hinting the correct pronouns yep. you know to a person so those were you know some of the kind of options that we came up with yeah I I love all of those and it's true um, you know, you don't want to, in helping address a problem, you don't want to become perceived as the problem and find yourself at NHR. And so knowing who those stakeholders and knowing who um, to, communi to communicate with is important, especially um, at the job. Um, in private or in your friend group, you know, that's one thing. But at work, it is important to know what the policies are um and uh, what some of those things are so those are all really good thank you group two who is doing our pronoun skit
that's that's me and all right Lashana and Cheryl okay let's do it and we're gonna do a skit for you um we are co-workers <clears throat> to set this up um we've uh have a new a new co-worker her name is Charlie and she has just uh, started and we're talking about her so we're not with her but we're talking about her okay okay Ashana are you there I don't see our third person yet. Lashonda? Is it was it Lashonda La Chapelle? Because I don't see her on the on the okay. call anymore. Then Cheryl and I will have to uh, okay. we'll have to take it. Okay. She evidently got dropped off. Okay. Okay. Um, Cheryl. Hi. Hi hey, there. Have, hey. have you have you did you talk to Charlie recently? She was just telling me um she had this really great weekend and she went um, skydiving and she's doing all these really great stuff and she's a thrill seeker and she's really cool. She's she's our new uh, co-worker. She just started a little, I think a week ago and she's doing all this great stuff. And have you talked to her? Uh, you know, I, I have, I've heard about her. I hear she's really good in language and speaking. She's a great speaker. And she can take steno. Remember the old steno where she could just write down what you're saying and keep up with everything that you're saying? She's going to be a great yeah. asset. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you see, know, what, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You I was going to say, you know, when we were talking with her, um, when she was introduced, she said something about wanting to be a, a, a they. I'm, I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to, what, how we're supposed to handle that. What do you mean a they? That's what she said. She was, her pronoun was a they. Oh, a pronoun. So they, them. Yeah. That's, so, I, don't you think we I always you, have a hard time remembering that. Yeah, um, me too. But I think I, to honor her, we should probably go ahead and, and uh, totally, I think we totally. should, you know, see what we could do. Let, let, let me try this. Um, but you um, just they, said her. <laughs> they said exactly they were a a, a a a great speaker uh they liked to speak in front of people so this would be really helpful for our meetings if we would ask they them we would ask them to uh, be our speaker our representative for that what do you think i think it's i you know as long as we're respecting her and and, and having everyone in the group give their pronouns it's still hard to remember everyone's pronouns in a group, but the fact that you well, practice makes perfect. Take notes when you're in the meeting so that you, to make that effort yeah. to respect what they want, and we'll learn. We, you know, eventually we'll remember people's pronouns. But and if we mess up, you know, we mess up. But as long as we, we keep trying, and they is a really great um, public speaker they loves to skydive those things will help us remember you know things about her um about they okay well let's get everybody about on board. them about them right? sounds good yeah let's get everyone <laughs> on board sounds good i love it and i love it. i know you had to adapt because your third person charlie didn't make it but i love it there were certain things that you guys did that were great the fact that you had the ability to practice you were like uh-oh Man, okay, so let me get this straight. They, them. And you two felt safe enough in your space or trusted enough to practice it and then even mess it up a bit. Like, uh oh, let me self correct and move on. That was wonderful. That is exactly what is required. That is exactly what we do. Um, and the fact that the conversation that Charlie wasn't there and you still leaned into the conversation and was honest, you know, it is hard remembering all these pronouns. Well, let's have everybody give their pronouns. Um, that way Charlie doesn't feel isolated or it's not bringing to the attention. Well, we know yours are different. So would it, what are you again? You know, like nobody got time for that. We don't want to do that. So that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Cheryl and Diana for uh, doing the skits uh, and for. Can I ask you a, a question? Well, sure, um, Cheryl. What's a couple that? things. What what do you suggest um, in in a professional setting? It, where is it most appropriate? Especially now, I mean, it's really common now in Zoom meetings. 
you see a person's name and their pronouns. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate to always ask that? Because I work with a, a transgender mm -hmm. uh, female youth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I asked them mm -hmm. what pronouns they would prefer, first he said, well, she said, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. And then after talking a little bit more with with them mm -hmm. they said you know i prefer them because they are trying to decide yep. they're, they're still you know and having you know going through therapy with mom because mm -hmm. mom is trying to figure out this whole process and it's totally foreign to her so mm -hmm. um so <laughs> Yeah, what do you do? I think the I think one way I I, I think it is um, I I don't think it's ever bad to ask. Um, okay, as long as you hold space for some people may not respond well. Like some people may still say whatever it doesn't matter, and um, the way to respond to that well, it's important to me to speak to you in ways that honor you. So if that changes, let me know. Um, and then if it were up to me and someone say it doesn't matter, what that says to me is that they would prefer it be something different than the norm and they are not comfortable or certain what that is. So I would try to use their name every time. Right, um, right. I would try not to, uh, while they are questioning and figuring it out, I would try to use their name, which is always acceptable. But I do think it, it is important to understand that people may not have it figured out. Um, some people, it's kind of like when Tracy was like, is it Shauna or Shannon? I'm like, whatever, I don't, either way, you know, I don't, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it doesn't mean that I don't have an identity. It just means that, is it important for me to go back and forth about it right now? Like over time you, you lose strength for the correction, right? Right. So um, I, I think it's always good to ask as if you are a decision maker uh, at your job, I think it's good for people to always to put pronouns and signatures because when everybody does it, it makes it normal. And then the person who does have a different one doesn't feel isolated or marginalized because they're the only ones who has to say something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do like um, as as. I work with youth programs and I'm noticing a lot of the programs ha are having that uh, as part of the um, curriculum. So when they gather to start their program, the first thing they do is they go around and they say their names and their pronouns. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I see that's um, positive is this next generation is growing up with that as being the norm to, to recognize each other's pronouns. Exactly. I agree. And I love to see it. I love to see it because again, it normalizes it. There'll be a day where pronouns are as common as saying somebody's name. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. A uh, group, uh, one, two, three, four, three ways to continue to educate yourself. What you guys come up with? I'll speak. Um, good morning, everybody. So we talked, we had a great conversation. Um, obviously, all of us um, are on board on uh, just being open to be sponges and take, you know, as much as possible, like trainings like this, as such, um, you know, literature, shows, um, documentaries, um, and, and just plain old talking to people, uh, humbling ourselves and, and, and listening um, and, and just saying, I don't know, um, can you help educate me, you know, excuse my ignorance type of thing. Um, I think people appreciate that. And I think, you know, in, in our in this evolving society, um, you know, it's something we must do, you know, these are human beings, um, they're around us, they work with us, they're in our families. Um, and, and there's no better way they, than to include them. Um, and there's one gal in my group, um, she works for a nonprofit and has kind of a legal background. So she said, um, you know, and in her trade, it's it's kind of like the law, and she's trying to kind of be uh, more aware and 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 being, you know, non biased, non judgmental, because it's hard. You know, a lot of these policies and laws are very strict driven, so it doesn't allow for that. Um, so we need to do better, and just just opening our minds up and, and our, our hearts up, and and taking as much as we can. Whether, like I said, that's literature, that's a class, it's a training, 
Um, I, I know in my organization, we're doing a lot of work um, around LGBTQ um, mm -hmm. and, and, and racial disproportionality and all of that. So just making us all more aware, you know, um, and, and helping us grow personally, professionally, um, spiritually, all that. I, I love it. I love it. I think it's important to have these conversations, to learn more, to educate ourselves, to, to share what you learned. Um, one thing I like to think about is like this mental Rolodex. You can't say what you don't know. And so like you can't begin to address the issue that you haven't studied or that you don't understand. Like you can be like, that's wrong, but your argument loses power when you be like well it's wrong because Shauna said so so you go ahead and figure that out so it's good to continue to educate yourself so that you give voice to what you feel to so you can find language for the things that you think and that you believe so when you do begin to have these conversations at other places you feel equipped um, because a lot of people especially a lot of people who negatively have negative feelings about these things they become very argumentative in ways that are meant to devalue and decenter the truth of the argument and so if you're going to advocate in this area or ally in this area, it's important to gather and learn um, from those in community, those who have written about it, those with different intersections, um, so that you can properly ally, so that you can properly advocate. The last group, um, last but definitely not least, um, tell me about the three uh, gender diverse activists uh, that you found and would someone who was in that group put them in the chat so that others can find them too, if you're able. Hey, Shana, this is Adele. Hi, Adele. Hey, uh, okay, so I'm with Donna and Darrell. So hey. I guess each one of us found one. So the first that I saw, <laughs> which I Googled it, it's the GATE. It stands for Global Action for Trans Equality. Mm. I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Probably maybe aware of this. But uh, basically, it's an international advocacy organization working towards justice and equality for trans, gender diverse, and intersex communities. So um, they have the, they envision a world free from human, right, human rights violation based on a gender identity, gender expression, and self sex characteristics. I can send the link to the, uh, in the chat. Uh, Donna also has something that she found that she probably want to share. Donna, Hi, thank you, Adele. Welcome, Donna. Donna or Darrell? Or Darrell. Uh, there's a, Dur Durrell says a uh, professor um, Arsling Swain in Ireland, and she is a professor in gender studies and social justice. Love it. That's Thank from you, Durrell. Durrell. Where's Donna? <laughs> and Donna, if you're in a space in an area, you cannot unmute. You can put it in the chat um, and do that as well. So excellent job. You have uh, mastered this uh, breakout session. Um, so I appreciate it. I Your think homework. We heard from the first group, China. And I want to, yeah, I want to raise our hand for the okay. one, one group. This is Demisha, sorry. Sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I was in a group actually with Olga and Jason. And okay. so, um, when we popped up in the breakout, because I think Olga was about to speak a moment ago, I saw her picture pop up and disappear. Um, but when we were in the breakout, R said number five as well. It didn't say number one. To so, oh, so you have two more uh, activists to share. Uh, yeah, and so uh, Olga was about to chime in, so I'm not going to take that away at this moment. But I do want to say that um, thanks to Jason, you know, he's in Canada actually. He uh, got a chance to research a few of them and put them in the um, chat for us for us to discuss. And I'll let Olga and Jason actually take over from this point, but I wanted to let them know, uh, let you guys know that we did get the number five. Thank Olga. you, Demisha. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Olga. Thank Jason. you. Yeah, sorry about that. We were looking for you. I didn't uh, notice we got five, so I'm not sure what happened. Uh, but yeah, Jason uh, found some really great uh, activists um, from an article, uh, Shinar, Sarkabayeva uh, is a feminist powerlifter from Kaskatan, doctoral student. 
she focuses more on civic activism, basically protecting and defending the rights of LGBT, LGBTI community members. Oh. And uh, there's Helen Tab uh, Tavares, uh, who, um, yeah, she does. She's more of a, she lives in Santiago, Cape Verde. Um, and she focuses more on like gender identity and fighting and especially protecting from um, people in the community from violence. And then you have a Sandra Moran, who is from uh, the first, Guatemala's first openly lesbian member of Congress. Um, and uh, she became an activist and she's definitely more focused on legislation and passing rights that help uh, protect LGBTI communities and women from violence as well. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like I'm not sure if Jason is still here, but if any of those, if there's a link to that article or um, if there's any information I can go in the chat to help um, other people connect, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much to my two group fives. Yeah, thanks, Jason. He's like, that article is really, I, I just put it up there. Perfect. Look, I'm gonna have to copy that article too. I wonder who these people are. Hold on, I'm actually doing it. There we go. All right, so we have done the um, we've done the breakouts. Yes, Cheryl, I will get the I, was, I will have a slide for that in one second. Um, we've done the breakouts, so now let's briefly talk about what happens when I feel challenged. Remain open. These may be topics that are uncomfortable that you have no familiarity, but just be willing to listen, research and learn. You will never know all there is on none of these subjects. Commit to learning and adding depth to your knowledge. Take feedback. Well, none of us know it all, not even me. I know it seems like it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> but I don't, I be slipping all the time. Uh, be willing to receive feedback, ask for help and consulting when needed and when you do not know, just as you all have done in signing up for these courses. So here I am. Um, oh, those nails are cute. That yellow is everything. I'll have to do that next time. Um, you can connect with me at the following places. My email address is down. So um, my Facebook and my Instagram. I really like Twitter lately. Um, they have really figured out the Twitter algorithm. You like one thing and you are going to see all that thing the next day. I appreciate that. Um, except for that one day I liked a bird and you would have thought I was working at the Audubon Society uh, the next day, how many birds was on my feet. I said, well, let me be a little more discerning. Um, but I'm Shauna Shaman on Twitter as well. So a lot of these spaces you'll see I show up um, in social justice conversations. I show up in uh, uh, women's theology um, and affirming theological conversations. Um, I show up in a lot of places where tables are getting flipped over. So you can come see me. I love to chat. I enjoy having these conversations. This is the work I was born to do. Um, uh, a word to the wise, don't assume that every black, black gay person you come around is going to do this work because they ain't. Um, everybody doesn't have the same capacity. So we have to be careful in assuming that people are here just for our intellectual and emotional labor. Um, so think about that when you ask questions and comments, when you don't Google it yourself. And also when someone who takes the time to educate you, make sure you check and see if they have a PayPal or a cash app, pay black women, pay trans women, pay marginalized folks to do the work that you have not wanted to do. That has been my talk today. I am Shauna Siobhan, uh, representing Inclusive Growth Strategies. Thank you all so much for leaning into these conversations and these trainings. Shauna, I wanted to say thank you so much. If we can give her either a virtual or an actual applause, uh, really appreciate it. It was a wonderful way to end what has been our diversity, equity, and inclusion series uh, since March. And so a lovely way to end it with some humor and some, some education and some real informative words. So we really appreciate you, Shauna. Um, everyone else, uh, here is your Friday back. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your Friday and your weekend. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you at our next training. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olga. Tracy, send an email to Danielle and say bye. Let her know she has loved working with you 